It also takes a certain type of person who is able to embody a level of ownership, which by the way, happens to be another one of our values actually is this idea of ownership. You know, if you've worked in a large company, it is very natural to be what I would call an employee. Like you have a very specific job, you do what you're told, but do you think about the greater whole and how you can potentially influence and make the business better holistically? And that's to me, the difference between an owner and an employee. And we look for owners. And of course there's a literal component. Everybody gets stock, but really trying to embody that sentiment. Maybe you're an engineer, but you go home and you wonder like, could I create more content for the website that would be attractive to potential users of the software? No degree can fully prepare you for being a founder and CEO. How do you determine the culture of your growing company? How do you grow? Do you bootstrap or seek funding? All daunting questions that you have to keep answering on top of actually running the company. Bootstrapping and taking venture capital both have their advantages and their disadvantages. Ultimately, they can both be effective ways to build a business. On this episode, a revenue pro who has been on both sides, from founding and leading a small bootstrapped company through growth and acquisition, to founding and running a company that has raised over $400 million in venture capital. Justin Bergman, founder and CEO of Starburst Data, is here to share his experience and wisdom. Over to you, Kyle. I'm Kyle Coleman, sales pro turned SVP of marketing at Clary. Run Revenue is the show where revenue pros learn to stop revenue leak, achieve revenue precision, and grow their companies and careers. This is Run Revenue Show with Kyle Coleman. Justin Borgman, thanks for joining the program. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I want to start off with a little bit of a bio blast here because you have been around, you've seen a lot of things. So in 2010, you started your first company, Hadapt. You were there for about four years until acquired by Teradata. You stuck around at Teradata as a VP and GM for, I think, about three years mm -hmm. until 2017 when you founded your current company, Starburst. Take us back to the early days at Hadapt. What did you learn running a company for the first time? What were some of the main lessons that stick with you? Oh, I learned so much. You know, a little bit of context for anyone listening. Hadapt was a SQL engine for Hadoop. And what that means is we were thinking about this open source platform called Hadoop that was just starting to gain some momentum. You know, there were companies in the space like Cloudera and Hortonworks that were starting to popularize Hadoop and more and more companies were using it to store mass amounts of data. And really our idea was to turn that into a true analytic database. So you could run SQL-based analytic queries, support business intelligence applications like Looker, where I know you spent some time or Tableau or, and others. And that was our big idea. Now it was actually formed from some research at Yale University. I was getting my MBA at the time and my co-founders were a professor and a PhD student in the computer science department who had come up with this idea. And so we commercialized that, spun that out of the, out of the university and then built that business over four years, raising venture capital along the way. I learned so much. I mean, I was, I think, 29 when I started the company. I don't think you can fully prepare for being a founder and CEO. Uh, I think you have to experience it. So much of it is learned through that experiential process. I don't even think necessarily an MBA can prepare you for it. But, you know, learned a lot about how to create the right culture and becoming much more refined on what culture means. I think like it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, but how you actually have a really productive, effective, durable, and scalable culture actually takes a lot of work. Can I pause you, Justin? I, yeah. I want to hear more about that because, you know, it's no secret, 2023, it's tough. The macro environment's yeah. tough, downturn, recession, whatever you want to call it. And culture is the thing that's going to see companies through a lot of this. So yeah. talk to us a little bit more, double click on what you just said. How do you define an enduring culture? What do you put into it? What do you get out of it? Yeah, well, I think when you're just starting out, it is a little more organic. You're sort of self-selecting for culture, whether you think about it intentionally or not. But I think once you get to maybe 20 or 30 people, I think you do need to become more intentional. And I would recommend even like codifying it at that stage so that it becomes something you can refer to and refer to often, I would say. I think that's one important thing is reinforcing those values every chance you get. You know, for us, uh, you mentioned this, you know, challenging market environment that we're all in, you know, from an economic perspective. And one of our values is grit. So we've been talking about grit for, you know, almost six years. 
and how startups have ups and downs and macroeconomic environments change. And you have to sort of have that toughness, that intestinal fortitude to withstand that. And that doesn't mean that it's not scary or it's not hard or it doesn't hurt at times, but you know, grit is really then getting back up and continuing to push forward. And so I feel like we're better prepared um, you know, psychologically or emotionally as a team, because we've been intentional about talking about this as an expectation of our folks, you know, like we want people who can handle hard. That's something we're actively, you know, selecting for. So that's one example, but I think the key is really being intentional and, you know, repeating it and highlighting it and reinforcing it every chance you get. I think that's so true, Justin, a mistake that I've seen a lot of companies make myself included is cultural values are defined top down and the mm -hmm. executive team says, oh, we, we have these aspirational values. We're going to put some posters up on the wall and then our work here is done. And that very rarely works. I've seen the best process at a couple startups that I've been at where the cultural values have been bottoms up, like literal workshop sessions, all hand sessions where employees go into breakout groups of six or eight people and they talk about the real true values that make the company what it is. And then there's a real conversation that happens. There's a real debate that happens. You see a lot of overlap, obviously, between these breakout groups. And then you land on the five or six cultural values that are real, that really make you what you are. And because if you go about that process where it's bottoms up, then all the employees feel bought in on the values. They actually live them. They sustain. They endure. As you mentioned, Justin, you hire for them. You use it as a screen for all the priorities and decisions that you make. So I love that point. It's really well said. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you. So let's talk about grit. And we'll now fast forward to 2017 when you found Starburst and you decide to go the bootstrap route as yep. opposed to the VC route. Obviously, that requires its own grit. That requires its own leap of faith. Talk to us about the decision to go bootstrap. Yeah. Another lesson from that first experience, um, which was a, a great learning experience. And ultimately, we had a decent outcome being acquired by Teradata. So so no regrets per se, but a lot of lessons learned. And I think one of them was the potential dangers of venture capital. And I guess really what I mean by that is the moment you take capital, a clock starts. A yep. certain level of expectation has been formed on a return of that capital in some time period. And so you have new pressures. Some of those pressures are good, but some of them are maybe not as good, especially if you're still perfecting product market fit. And so to me, I wanted the space, I wanted uh, the patience to be able to go explore and iterate and experiment with no time pressure. And so that was what was a lot of fun about the first two years of Starburst is, you know, the board meetings were like by myself in the shower, you know, like that where there was no uh, external pressure. It was us just continuously iterating, learning, trying new things. We didn't have to update the board or explain anything really other than to ourselves. And that allowed us to move incredibly quickly and I think have, you know, just a very intimate relationship with our customers, which was so important because we depended on them. I mean, I think when you bootstrap, by definition, you are profitable out of survival. If you don't have the cash flow, then you die. And so you just become so appreciative and so tied in to making your customers successful. And I think those are like great instincts that we forced ourselves to develop in those early couple of years. I want to drill in on that in a second, but I want to go back to something you said, which is felt like you, you had this opportunity to constantly be experimenting. I'm curious to hear about some of those experiments, whether it's from a go-to-market standpoint or a product development standpoint, any particular experiments you ran in those first two years where you're like, man, I'm really glad we did that. We learned a ton, avoided a pitfall, accelerated growth, whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. I think perfecting the value proposition and the business model required mm. iteration at that point. I, I like to joke, but not really joke, that we've done all three major open source business models in the span of, you know, just a few years. You know, the early open source models were really support oriented. You know, the software is free and we offer support. And that's really how we started Starburst was just mm. supporting existing users. But I think there are limits to the degree with which you can build a big business that way. I think especially for very sophisticated customers, support is only worth so much is sort of what we learned along the way. And so from there, we started to develop our own proprietary capabilities that weren't available in the open source. And, you know, we found a lot of traction around access controls, basically security features that ensure that 
you have access to the data that you're supposed to have access to, and I can't see that data. And doing that at a very fine-grained level, like individual rows and columns, being able to mask data, maybe PII data, sensitive data, those features became very valuable to regulated industries, big banks, retailers, healthcare companies. And so that was kind of like our first breakthrough, I would say, on the business model was like, okay, we've got an enterprise edition now with features that only Starburst can offer. And, you know, there is a segment of the open source user base that needs those features and is willing to pay for those features. And then, you know, if I fast forward to more recent history, in the last couple of years, we've introduced a SaaS version of our platform. So now mm -hmm. there's a cloud version that adds another dimension to the value proposition, which is we just run everything and make it easy for you. So those were all like really important evolutions, kind of going from support to, you know, proprietary features, which people would call an open core model. The core was still open source, but there were extra features around it. And now, you know, a SaaS, you know, cloud version that we offer. That's very impressive. So now, again, going back to the bootstrap days, the first two years at Starburst, you mentioned this, it's a forcing function for operating efficiently, for thinking about profitability at all times. It has to be. It's a yep. matter of survival here. It, what's yeah. interesting, the juxtaposition, Justin, is that so many other founders were trained very differently in this same time period where you're cutting your teeth, bootstrap, efficiency, maintain profitability. So many other founders took VC money and it was growth yep. at all costs regardless of burn rate, regardless of runway, regardless of anything else. It was hyper growth, hyper fast, no other choice. So talk to us a little bit about running a business with efficiency. What are the hallmarks? What are you looking for? How do you do it well? I think the biggest thing is you question every investment that you make. Like mm. you really pressure test, is there an ROI to this investment? I think when you're just rapidly scaling, every leader in the organization is saying, I need this person, I need that person. But do you really need them? And headcount generally is your greatest expense in a software company. So are those really jobs that you know, need to be broken out and individualized and specialized at this point? Or can we still be you know, scrappy and more utilitarian with utility players? You know, in the very early days, just to, you know, maybe when we were the first 30 employees, you know, I was basically doing our finance and accounting. I was still very involved in selling even after we had a couple of sales reps. You know, I played multiple roles and I think many or most of the people at Starburst at that point in time did. And so you get more efficiency out of that. But it also takes a certain type of person who I think is able to embody a level of ownership, which by the way, happens to be another one of our values actually is this idea of ownership. And I think, you know, if you've worked in a large company, it is very natural and understandable to be what I would call an employee. Like you have a very specific job, you do what you're told, you may be a good employee, but do you think about the greater whole and, you know, how you can potentially influence and make the business better holistically? And that's to me the difference between an owner and an employee. And we look for owners. And of course, there's a literal component. Everybody gets stock in Star Wars, but really trying to embody that sentiment, that feeling of like, you know, maybe you're an engineer, but you go home and you wonder, like, could I create more content for the website that would be, you know, attractive to potential users of the software? And so I think those things create efficiency. I think also you have to think very carefully about um, your go to market organization. I think that's where a lot of expense can go. Mm. And, you know, just how productive can your teams be? What do you need to make them productive? And sometimes investments will be necessary that actually raise the productivity across the entire organization. So enablement is a great example of this, right? Where, you know, the better you educate and prepare new hires, the more productive they will be. So that's actually a good investment, even though they may not carry a quota, they're hopefully increasing the productive capacity of everybody else. So I think it's really just an intentionality and like a very much sense of ownership of where every dollar and cent goes. I love that. And I love that that concept of ownership is one of your main cultural values. If you have people thinking about how they can make an impact, make a contribution beyond their role, it creates this unbelievable multiplier effect where they do. And you have engineers that are writing blog posts. It's not just good marketing. It's also good for recruiting. And there's yep. this halo effect that ends up getting created and people just are bought in to making the company successful and doing their best work. I know it seems a little disconnected from efficiency, but it isn't. And I love how you connected the dots there. Now, 
you've mentioned a couple of times establishing product market fit. In mm -hmm. the early days, you're embedded with mm -hmm. customers, you're learning from them, you're doing whatever you can to be successful. I have heard tales of founders doing exactly this, but having, let's call it happy ears when they're dealing with customers and the customer is telling them what they want to hear and the founder is saying, okay, great, we do all these things, no action required. Did you ever experience that? How did you maybe take off the rose-colored glasses, put on a little more skeptical glasses and make sure that you're actually developing a product that suits all the various needs of the customers that you're embedded with? Well, maybe another thing that we did, and I think uh, bootstrapping forces this as well, is that we were always selling, you know, from day one. We didn't have an incubation period where we were trying to, you know, build the perfect thing. We were selling on day one, and that meant that that was tested continuously. And I think that was another, you know, good side effect of that is that the time between, you know, an idea and, you know, testing it in the field was almost instantaneous. Love that. So yeah. now take all of these lessons that you learned in your bootstrap days. We'll get to your venture back days mm -hmm. here in a moment. But I'm curious, you know, we've mentioned already that 2023 is going to be tough. What advice do you have for founders, for leaders to get through these tough times? I think it's a lot of like back to basics, like focus on the fundamentals, the things that are the strongest elements of your business uh, that you know works and continue to sort of double down on those. I think it's an opportunity to clarify your focus when you don't have to be as judicious about where you put your resources, your focus can naturally broaden. But, you know, with constrained resources, you don't have that luxury. I think that can actually be a really good thing and potentially make you move a lot faster. Focus generally can create speed for you in a business. So, you know, those would be a couple thoughts. I think depending on how you built the company up to this point, you may need to do a little bit of a cultural reset. If the expectations of your employees is a particular lifestyle or particular set of benefits or particular comfort of some kind, you may have to reorient that. I think you're seeing that with actually the Facebooks and Googles, which is pretty interesting to watch from my standpoint, because those have been some of the most generous employers in the industry and have really kind of coddled, I would say, a lot of the population. And so now they're turning hard and people are like shocked and surprised. And right. that depends on how you built your business. For us, like because of those grassroots beginnings, that was never us. We were never the, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, type of place, but some were, and you may have to correct some of those things and change some of those things. And I think being very um, honest and transparent in why you're doing that is important to, to any big change. That is the key point at the end, the honesty, the transparency, the visibility. Not every leader is capable of doing that or is willing to do that because those conversations aren't easy. Telling people what they don't want to hear, sharing the hard truths is not always easy. Um, I want to go back to the first way you answered this question, Justin, was back to basics and fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Bring that to life a little bit for us. What does that mean for Starburst? What are some of the things that you're doing where you're reorienting, you're back to basics, you're focusing on fundamentals? Mm -hmm. Well, we're focusing on customers and customer segments, maybe to be more precise, where we know that we do really well. You know, I think any startup wants to own the entire market and you can get there eventually, but focus is so key. And so really narrowing in on the types of customers, the segment of the market where we do really, really well and focusing around that. So, you know, for us, a lot of what we do is we make data lakes faster. We allow you to basically use a data lake like a data warehouse. Um, but part of the unique capabilities of Starburst is that we can also query other data sources as well. So we kind of turn the data warehousing model inside out. And, you know, finding customers that already have data in a data lake is a really good spot for us because we don't have to explain the value of a data lake. We don't have to teach them that they're going to save a ton of money relative to a cloud data warehouse. They get it already. And so, you know, that's an example. We also know that we do really well in larger companies, larger enterprises, because they generally have data silos. And one of our special capabilities is that we can federate queries across multiple data sources. So you can join data in Oracle and Teradata with data in S3 in the cloud and, you know, MySQL or whatever. And so the more uh, data sources you have, you know, the more obvious our value proposition is as well. And so those are kind of the refinements that I think we're going through. And I think, you know, a lot of companies probably should go through to really maximize the ROI of every dollar they're putting in. And we know if we focus on those things, we're going to get a, the maximum ROI. 
doesn't mean we don't want to expand, but it's just prioritization. And I think that's so much of startup life is really prioritization. It's as much not doing what you shouldn't do yeah. as it yeah. is doing what you should do. So prioritization, focus, intentionality, but narrowing those focus areas to make sure that you can actually deliver what you need to deliver on. And it's such good advice. And you know what's so interesting about it, Justin, is people expect or hope that there's some silver bullet, that there's some magic trick that they can perform that'll help them get through the tough times. But there's not. It is exactly what you said. It's back to basics. It's fundamentals. It's the things that you know can lead to repeatable and scalable success. And it requires you to do the hard work. There's no getting around it. Very well said. Let's fast forward now. So bootstrap for two years. And yep. now you've raised $414 million <laughs> yep. in the last few years. So yep. to juxtapose these two universes, the bootstrapped versus the very richly backed VC world. Yeah. So there are some similarities and some differences. I mean, the, the obvious difference is with the cash, we have accelerated growth and particularly growth of our go-to-market. You know, we went from two salespeople plus myself, I guess I count myself in those early days, uh, you know, to now a sales organization that's nearly 300 people, if you include everything from customer success to pre-sales and field reps. So huge, huge growth within, a, I think, three-year period. And most of that being during a pandemic too, right? And trying to figure out how to train and enable people remotely in many, many times. So very big change. I think the similarities, though, really go back to some of those cultural values that were established early on. And the way that we think about, you know, trade-offs and investment decisions within our business. So, you know, those things stay the same, but everything has scaled up. And I think as a result, we have to work a little bit harder now to remind ourselves to be efficient because we have the luxury of capital. And I think sometimes that can be dangerous. And so we try to try to be very mindful of the things that got us where we were in the early days are still things that we want to achieve today. And, and of course, in the current market conditions, now efficiency is more valued than it has been for, for quite some time. And so, you know, we want to maintain that and hopefully improve that, you know, as we approach an IPO. It's amazing. And 300 people in three years. That is yeah, for... just on the go-to-market side. We're actually just over 100 globally across the company. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, congratulations again, Justin, all that growth. That is truly impressive. Obviously, some of the new folks that you've brought on are pretty senior leaders. Mm -hmm. Do you find any mismatch in expectations from those senior leaders versus yourself and some of your earlier leaders that cut their teeth through the bootstrap days versus perhaps a, a newer class of leadership who maybe didn't have to learn lessons the hard way? I think we've done a good job of filtering for that as mm -hmm. we've hired, because I do think that's a potential risk, what you're speaking to. But I think people learn pretty quickly sort of our mentality, our way of doing things, our culture, our values. And frankly, like I think I'm probably a little bit more in the financial details than a lot of people are maybe used to. Yeah. And again, out of necessity. I mean, I, I did our accounting. I paid our <laughs> bills. You know, we joke that I was our CFO, you know, back then. And we, we used to actually create different names for our different personalities as we had to do different jobs. So Jane was my, my alter ego for CFO. There was like Jane and Justin. And anyways, we had a lot of fun with that. So they get pretty acquainted with that, I think, in the interview process. And I think we've done a good job of filtering for people who want to build something sustainable. And that's really what we're all about is trying to create something sustainable that, you know, has a lasting impact on this industry. That's a great pivot point for us, Justin, this, this point of sustainability, this point of resiliency. We were talking last week, you mentioned that Starburst has two different revenue models simultaneously. You have the more traditional license-based SaaS sort of model, and then you have the relatively modern usage-based, consumption-based model. Talk us through each of those models and then pros of having both at the root simultaneously. Clarify slightly. So I guess our underlying pricing metric for everything is really consumption oriented. It's based mm. on compute consumption. Mm -hmm. So as you're running more queries, as you're processing more data, you're consuming more CPU time, essentially. And that's our underlying metric. But we do transact in a few different ways. We'll do what we call a commit to consume, where you're committing to a certain amount of consumption over the course of the year. And that is a upfront, you know, fixed um, cost essentially. And then you'll burn down that commitment over the year. 
And then we'll also do, uh, you know, what we would call a pay go consumption model sure. where you start with a zero dollar contract and you just start to consume. And in fact, we try to make that as easy and frictionless as possible. You can even use AWS Marketplace or Google Marketplace or Azure Marketplace, and you can transact with your own cloud commit that you have to those vendors. So maybe you have a enterprise you know, plan with AWS and you want to you know, use some of that commit to buy Starburst, you can actually do that through the marketplace very easily. And so we try to make that as frictionless as possible. I think that's one of the benefits of the consumption model is essentially the customer is only paying for what they use. But those are the two ways that we contract today. Where did this DNA for this consumption-based revenue model come from? It is relatively new. It hasn't been around for too long. So how did you decide that this was the right path for Starburst? Yeah, well, I would say some of the peers in our space were starting to use elements of this model themselves. So, uh, you know, we operate in the same space as Snowflake and Databricks. Those are probably the two big players in our space. And they similarly have consumption-oriented models. So we knew that our customers wouldn't be confused by it, that it made sense to them. Uh, and we also thought it was a good proxy for the value that we're providing them. And again, I think that's the great benefit of, you know, that if you're spending money with Starburst, you are getting value out of it because that means that you're consuming. Thinking around that and thinking about the future direction of the industry was a big part of it. We also hired our CRO from MongoDB and he was very involved in Atlas, their cloud product. So that was another big driver. Uh, he has a ton of experience with these types of sales motions. And he's also a very big believer in wanting to eliminate as much friction as possible up front and get the flywheel going, get the consumption going. Nice, nice. And I wonder, and I don't know if this is true or not, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but I expect that you're able to look at consumption patterns, your own customers' consumption patterns, and have a sense of your own company's performance. So yeah. do you use the consumption patterns as an indicator of you know, potential future outcomes for Starburst? We do. Absolutely. It tells us a lot, actually. It's almost like amazing that we didn't have this, you know, let's say 10 years ago, you know, in my first startup when, you know, you're selling software and you're kind of like throwing it over the, over the wall and who knows how much they use it or whether they use it. Uh, you really have no visibility into that. But with the telemetry that you're able to grab from the consumption, not only do we know how much they're using it or when they're using it or what time of day they're using it, but with the way that our product works, we're connected to a variety of other data sources because that's what we do. We can run queries on all these different databases. So we get to actually learn which databases they're querying too, which is really interesting and see patterns there. You know, Are they moving from on-prem data warehouses to cloud data warehouses? Are they moving from data warehouses to data lakes to save some money? You know, How much SAP do we see out there? It turns out there's actually a lot of customers using SAP you know, with Starburst. So we learn a lot through that data. It's really, really helpful from a product management perspective, from a marketing perspective, and from a sales perspective. Let's talk about that sales perspective real quick. I'm, I'm very curious to understand how you forecast consumption-based revenue. Talk to us about the methodology there. So if it is a commit to consume, you know, we feel like we've got a you know, essentially an estimate on that consumption and they've committed to it. So we can count that as a booking because they're going to ultimately uh, consume that one way or another, or pay for that, I should say, one way or another. In the pay-go consumption, it is definitely harder, and you do see much more variability you know, from week to week or month to month. So we try to take a running average over the course of our quarter. That's kind of what mm -hmm. we look at and take, okay, what is a three-month average of consumption? And then you know, multiply that by four to sort of get an ARR you know, equivalent. And that's the way we try to average it out. But there is definitely more variability and it does feel like you get a real-time view of everything going on. Is there any human judgment that is applied? Because that forecast methodology you just mentioned is very, you know, quantitatively oriented, very machine oriented. Yeah. Is, do you apply any human judgment to that? Like as an example, if you, Justin, or your CRO have an outlook on 2023 that perhaps is a little softer than 22, do you downgrade that machine produced forecast in any way? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, not that I'm aware of. I don't believe that we do, except for maybe in isolated circumstances where, you know, we know that a customer either is just coming online and 
you know, they're over consuming what they're likely to consume over the next 12 months because they're, you know, I don't know, getting a lot of things ready or under consuming for similar reasons. You know, we may adjust the forecast on an individual opportunity level, but we're not adjusting it on a broader systemic basis that I'm aware of. Yeah, interesting. There are a lot of folks out there, a lot of revenue leaders out there who want to introduce some sort of consumption based revenue stream to the business for all the reasons that you mentioned, the resiliency it provides, the predictability it provides, the customer insights it provides. Any advice you have to those leaders for what to do or not to do as you think about introducing consumption-based revenue to your business? Yeah, I'll say one, which may be a little controversial. I, I think investing instrumentation early has a lot of benefits. And I say controversial only because you're always trading things off when you're building something. You may be trading off a feature that a customer actually cares about, uh, for instrumentation. And so those are those can be challenging trade-offs. But the instrumentation tells you so much that will ultimately, you know, perhaps inform your roadmap and help you make better decisions. You know, I think it's worth, you know, making those product investments, knowing the trade-off that it might mean, you know, we don't get the cool new feature as fast as we'd like. Um, but thinking hard about that. And how do you go about making the pricing decision for the consumption-based model that you have? Is it as I said, not as many companies are doing this, so you don't have as much benchmarking as perhaps you would have for a more SaaS-based offering. How did you go about it? How did you land on the right pricing? Well, again, I guess maybe in our space, maybe we're a little luckier that there are some comps that we could look at. Okay. So we could look at Snowflake, we could look at Databricks, we could look at some of Amazon's products as well. Um, you know, given that we're based on an open source project called Trino, AWS actually uses Trino in a couple of their products. One is called Athena, another one's called EMR. So we have some, you know, uh, additional data points there to incorporate in our kind of pricing analysis. But I think also whenever you're early or introducing a new product, there's an element of art over the science at that point right. too. And, right. and again, just experimenting and trying to get it right. Very good. Very good. Okay. Last question for you, Justin. This one is uh, one of my favorites to ask people. You are unsuspecting here. So it's a bit of a, a lightning round. I'm curious what book you would recommend for specifically for founders, two-time founder, you've mm -hmm. been there, any particular book that you would recommend? There are a couple, but I think the one that always comes to the top of my list is The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Horowitz. Ben, ben Horowitz. Yeah. I think it's very um, real, very authentic, very operational, you know, not as much business theory and much more like practical, applicable, you know, advice. Uh, so I think for an entrepreneur in the trenches or any operator, actually, I think could get a lot of benefit out of that. It is a very raw look at what it's like to build companies. And I appreciate that. It's one that I've gone back to a couple of times. Yeah, it is very solid. Okay. One more recommendation, which is most of our listenership are going to be go to market leaders. You have a beautiful blend of technical expertise and acumen, as well as go to market and business expertise and acumen. What would you recommend to these go to market leaders? to develop more empathy for the technical people at their company? Oh, that's an awesome question. In fact, if I ever write a book, I've got one in mind. It'll be something like salespeople are from Mars, engineers are from Venus. I don't know if you know this relationship book, <laughs> of but course. parents had it, you know, like in the 80s or something, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And I think the reason a book like that needs to be written is because there are a lot of differences. And yeah. I think very often they talk past each other and are just not speaking the same language. So. I have like, we could do a whole podcast probably just on this topic because it's one I reflect on. But I think, you know, number one is appreciating that there are differences in worldviews and in like how they think about the world at almost every fundamental level. I think a second thing is technical folks, engineers and so forth are very focused on details. Details matter. They're going to be much more likely to be pedantic about those details. Precision matters. Yep. Uh, so choose your words carefully, I would say. I don't mean that in like a threatening way, but like be very precise about the language that you choose because they'll take those words very, very literally. And they're focused on like the individual blades of grass when a seller may be more focused on the bigger forest. Another thing to keep in mind is I think engineers tend to be very long-term strategy oriented. And sellers naturally have a quota and it's something to do this quarter, right? right. And so there's a difference on perception of urgency, I would say. It's not that engineers don't work hard, but they have a different time scale of which they're thinking about it, urgency. So that's another area I see a lot of friction is that sellers are like, look, I got to get this deal done, this deal done right now. And, you know, an, an engineer, you know, is thinking about something, you know, six months from now. So 
those are a couple pieces of advice. I really do think it's like learning a language of a different type of person. And if you can appreciate both, I think that's a really valuable, valuable thing. It's really well said, Justin. Founder, chairman, CEO of Starburst. Thank you so much for your time today, Justin. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Kyle. It's been fun. Don't let what you heard today go to waste. Take two minutes to download today's checklist to get your priorities in line for the week. You can find that linked in our show notes. And if you liked what you heard, make sure you give us a five-star rating and leave a review. We'll be back next Monday with more to help you win your week.